Okay, recording. Okay, so welcome to Kabbalah Decoded. You can get more. Um, you can get more information, more stuff at the website kabbalahdecoded.com. And one of these days soon, hopefully, I will be uh, adding things there on a more regular basis. Um, more articles and so on and so forth. But that is for the future. In any event, um, I'm assuming that the sound is okay because I'm not getting any complaints. So we'll take it from here. This week's Torah reading is... Um, known as Chayei Sarah, meaning the life of Sarah. And the strange thing about it is that um, it seems to not be really about the life of Sarah, but about, about the passing of Sarah. And um, strange that it should be called the life of Sarah. Now, there's actually, um, we're going to speak about this a lot, but just to first tell a, uh, a, um, a little story that I hope is related to this in some way, we'll, <laughs> I'll try and make it related anyway. There was a fellow who um, came to visit from, um, from Russia. He came to visit his uh, nephew. His brother's son, who had um, come to live in America, and this man had never been out of Russia, and he lived in a fairly um, uh, rural setting. So he was, you know, even by Russian standards, he was a very sort of um, lived a very simple life and very uncomplicated, and so on and so forth. Anyway, his nephew, who had become fairly uh, well off, um, invited him and he bought him a ticket and he picked him up at the airport, at uh, JFK, whatever, wherever it was. And uh, he wanted to show off his new life in America and like what it's like to live in America. So he took his uh, uncle to, to Walmart. <laughs> you know, America Central, right? So he took his uncle to Walmart and his uncle's eyes just like almost fell out of their sockets. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. And uh, because, you know, in Russia, life is tough. I mean, um, certainly in those days, this was uh, just after, you know, um, not long after Glasnost, that, um, they hadn't yet become, uh, you know, the oligarchs hadn't yet started to arise in Russia and so on. And in, in any event, he was completely uh, stunned about what it was that he was uh, seeing so he's asking his nephew, uh, "What's this and what's that and what's the other thing and all the packaging and all the you know, all the choices?" He couldn't he couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, you know get uh, you know fifteen different kinds of apples and uh, so on and so forth. He couldn't believe it. In any event, his nephew's taking him down. He takes him to sort of the uh, the dry goods section of the um, of the Walmart, and uh, he's showing him, and he says, and what's this? Yes, he says, well, that's, that's powdered soup. You just, you know, add a bit of water, and you have soup. And what's this over here? Oh, well, that's powdered coffee. All you do is add hot water, and you have, uh, and you have coffee. And the uncle's just amazed. He says, we don't, we don't have anything like this in our country. This is amazing. And uh, they're going down the um, they're going down the uh, down the rows and down the aisles, and uh, you know the, the uh, nephew is buying what he needs to buy. And uh, what's this? And this is uh, this is dried mashed potatoes. You just add hot water, and you have mashed potatoes. And uh, what is that? That's uh, whatever it was. You know, some some other thing, uh, oatmeal, whatever. You just add hot water, and you and you got your oatmeal. Eventually, they turn around the corner and they come to a thing, and he sees these like uh, tall white containers, and he says to his uh, nephew, and and and, um, and and what's that? So the nephew says, "Oh, that's baby powder." So the the, the uncle looks at him and he says, <laughs> "What? No, I prefer the Russian way of making it. This is for me. This is this is this is um, you know, babies. <laughs> Understand? So okay, that was a joke. Okay, so." Um, folks, when sometimes we, when we talk about, when we talk about, um, our forebears, when we talk about our forebears, like Sarah and about Abraham and so on and so forth, 
there are many, many levels of what we're talking about. It's not just, you know, don't, don't, it's not just you add water and, uh, and you're good to go kind of thing. There's obviously a tremendous amount of depth to the characters that we see over there. It's not these, you know, it's not comic books. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, these are not comic book, uh, comic book characters. These are not people who, um, are just sort of one-dimensional, two-dimensional. These are multi-dimensional people with tremendous, uh, tremendous depth to them. So we have to understand a little bit, about, a little bit about Sarah, about Abraham, and so on. The Zohar, when describing the first few verses of this week's Torah reading, says like this: uh, "So the life of Sarah, and when it goes on to say, was 100 years and 20 years and seven years." These were the years of these. These were the years of the life of Sarah, 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah, and then she passes away. And it says, Abraham, Abraham, her husband Abraham, came to mourn for Sarah and to um, and to weep for her. He came to mourn and to weep for her. So what the Zohar says says, this is really talking about the soul. After a life, after life in this body, in this world, when a person passes away from this world, the soul weeps over the body. Abraham represents the soul, Sarah represents the body. And the soul weeps for the body. Why does the soul weep for the body? After all, the soul is basically eternal life. So here is the whole secret. That the soul, even though the soul in its purity and holiness and so on and so forth is a wonderful and great thing, nevertheless, the ability of the soul to advance and to rise, rise and to be and to become more and more holy really depends on the body. It depends on the body. So therefore, when the soul sees that it no longer has a body with which to work, it weeps. Because now, whatever level of holiness and purity it reached, the soul reached through life, through living the proper life in this world, that is going to be its level from now on. Although all of the worlds, as we've explained uh, many, many times, uh, go in a sort of a helix, um, in a spiral upwards, that everything is always in a spiral upwards and moving upwards, but there's moving upwards in, a orderly, in an orderly fashion. In other words, step by step, step by step. And there's moving upwards in a quantum leap fashion. The ascent of the soul after death, after living in this world, after having been in, 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 in clothes in a body in this world, the ascent of the soul is only step by step, step by step, and it depends essentially on the elevation of all of the levels and all of the worlds together. Whereas when the soul is in the body, it has the ability to make a quantum leap from one level of holiness to an extremely more elevated level of divine consciousness that it simply could not attain, cannot attain, as it is out of the body. This is very similar, in fact, to um, what the Kabbalah describes about the angels. There's various verses <clears throat> that talk about the soul being a mover. The word used is mahalchim. It's walking. Ben ha omdim ha eile, between it walks amongst those who stand still. Who are those who stand still? Those who stand still are the angels. Those who walk 
or at least have the potential to walk, to move, to ascend, to proceed, that's the soul. The souls have the ability to move, whereas angels do not. Now, the angels have another, have a, they have an advantage, that's their disadvantage, they have an advantage as well. The Rebbe of Kotsk, the Hasidic leader of uh, Kotsk, his name was Menachem Mendel of Kotsk, very, was a very sharp um, uh, man with very, uh, sort of a very sharp tongue. He sometimes say, uh, very some very sharp things, but what he said about the angels is they have an advantage and a disadvantage. Their advantage is that they don't fall. The disadvantage is that they don't rise, or at least they only rise with the tide, so to speak. They rise with all the other boats, but they don't rise exponentially. They only rise gradually. Souls have the opposite quality. They have the negative quality, the negative possibility that they could fall but to have the positive possibility that they could rise, but rise exponentially. Now, the ascension of the soul, and I'm not talking about the ascension of the soul after death, but the ascension of the soul, is the ascent of the soul during life, that is what it's all about. That is what life in this world is all about. In other words, you will get... Um, there are many very spiritual people, very um, uh, dedicated and spiritual people who their goal in life is essentially really to leave this world. They start doing it by um, isolating themselves from society, perhaps in an ashram or in a monastery or in a cave or in a whatever. And they become sort of hermits and they divorce themselves from this world and they spend most of their time in the spiritual realms. And that's not a terrible thing. However, the ascent that they can experience through spiritual detachment from this world is limited. Kabbalah teaches us that the greatest ascent that the soul can have which is why the soul in the, first in the first place agrees to come down to this world, to this physical body. Because if the soul is already on a higher level before it comes down to the body, what on earth would it come down here for? So the, the, uh, the, uh, the Kabbalah's answer is it comes down, it descends in order to ascend even higher than it was before. The only possibility of the soul to ascend in a quantum leap, in an exponential kind of a, a leap, is by coming down into the physical world, coming down into a physical body. So you see, <clears throat> the physical body therefore has to be treated not only as an ally of the soul, not as an enemy of the soul, not only as an ally, but in fact the body should be treated as a holy vessel. That's why we see that what does Abraham do with the body of Sarah? After uh, she passes away, so he buys a burial plot. Now, he doesn't just buy any regular burial plot. He buys a burial plot where Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava, Adam and Chava were buried. Now, why would he do that? In fact, the Zohar tells that when Abraham came to bury Sarah in the cave, yeah, he paid 400 pieces of silver, he paid a tremendous amount for it, he had to uh, bargain with uh, Ephron uh, about the price of the cave and so on and so forth. E Ephron really didn't know the worth of the cave. Uh, he, wasn't, he probably wasn't aware that, they were, uh, that, uh, that Adam and Sarah, Adam and Eve were, uh, were buried there. But in any event, um, the, the Zohar tells that when, um, yeah, and that's a very good question, Avner, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, when we, um, when Abraham comes along to the cave, the souls of Adam and Eve come out and say, you cannot bury Sarah here. Why not? 
because for us, it is an embarrassment if you bury Sarah here. An embarrassment. Um, what does that mean? Because, they said, Sarah perfected herself in this life to the extent that she rectified the sin of the tree of evil, of knowledge of good and evil. We were the ones that fell in that sin, and she rectified it. Therefore, it would be embarrassing for us, it would be shameful for us, for her to be buried here. So Abraham says, I will intercede on your behalf that that sin should be rectified not only for her and the rest of the world, but for you too. And then he buries uh, Sarah there, and he later on is buried there, and Isaac and Rebekah, Isaac and Yitzchak and Rivka are buried there, and later on Yaakov, Jacob, and Leah. And Leah are buried there as well. Rachel is not buried there, but so I want to ask the question, why did he buy something that already belonged to him? That is uh, a good question. It belonged to him uh, because God had already promised him the land. And in fact, he argues, he, he implicitly tells Ephron, he said, if I want, I could take the land because it belongs to me. It was already given to me by God. I can take it and it's mine and my right. I'm offering you um, to buy it so that you shouldn't feel that something that uh, was given to you to look after um, uh, caused you some kind of uh, detriment or whatever. In any event, he, he's willing to pay for the land because he argues to himself that Eretz Yisrael niknet b'yisurim, the land of Israel is acquired with struggle and with difficulty. And that's just the way, the way the sages express it that the land of Israel doesn't come easily, even though it was a gift given to us by God, but we have to earn it. And Abraham was willing to uh, not rest on the promise that God gave him that he would get the land, but in fact work to acquire it. And in the process of doing so, show that he really, how much he really valued this acquisition that had already been given to him. In any event, one of the lessons that comes out of, uh, of this idea that Abraham buys the land and then he buries Sarah in this cave and he weeps for her. What does he do afterwards? afterwards? The idea that comes out of this primarily is not only the value of the body because Sarah represents the body again and Abraham represents the soul. Not only is, um, not only is that a valid uh, lesson, but the next lesson is what happens next? What happens after he buries Sarah and spends the week of mourning, as is the custom? He gets up from there he gets up from his mourning period. And the next thing that he does is he starts to build again. He makes sure that his son, Isaac, Yitzhak, gets married. Here's the lesson. After all the trials and tribulations that Abraham went through with Sarah at his side, and she saved his life on two occasions, After the um, almost sacrificing his son, as was commanded by God, to take him up onto the mountain and to offer him up there, and Abraham understood from that that he had to offer up his son as a sacrifice, and he bound Isaac and he put him on the altar. He was about to slaughter him when the voice came out of heaven, don't slaughter him, that was not really the intention. The intention was, I wanted you to go through this, I wanted you to go through to, it was a test for Abraham. It was his final, the tenth test. Actually, I'll talk about that in a second. Abraham went through ten tests. And the final test, according to most commentaries, was the uh, Akeda, the binding of Isaac. And he passed that test. Once he passed that test, it was not necessary for him to slaughter. He just had to be willing to do so for the sake of God. 
but in the end, um, he did not do so, and offered a ram instead that was uh, that he was shown that was caught in the uh, shrubbery and so on and so forth. There are other commentaries that say there was another test that came, the tenth test. This was this that the binding of Isaac was the ninth test. It was a tenth test. The tenth one was the death of Sarah. Sarah. So when Sarah dies, when Sarah dies, Abraham is now distraught. He doesn't have a life left. It's all over. How many people have we seen, unfortunately, um, I'm sure we all have experience of people who've gone through tremendous loss. They've lived with someone all of their lives, perhaps, or for many, many, many years. And then that person passes away and the person cannot, the uh, survivor cannot be consoled. There was, uh, yeah, he married Keturah, he married Hagar, but that wasn't, uh, that's not the, the, the point I'm moving to here. Um, he was already married to her before anyway. Um, the, um, the interesting thing is, um, there was a story actually with the famous psychiatrist Viktor Frankl. The, um, the psychiatrist who um, who uh, was the proponent of the theory called logotherapy. Logotherapy therapy means the therapy, essentially the therapy of purpose. When a person has a purpose in his life, he can survive. He can get through any difficulties and, and trauma and, uh, and, uh, and uh, loss and so on and so forth if he has something to live for. So there was a story that was told uh, that he tells about a man who was married for many, many, many years. He was married for like... Um, something like 60 years, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, maybe maybe even more than 60 years. And uh, his wife passed away. And he was, inconsol uh, he was inconsolable. He just, his life was finished, it was over. He, he was so close to his wife, they had a wonderful relationship for all the years that they were married. And he was, it was impossible to console him. To the extent that he was on, he was probably on the verge of a nervous breakdown, and he decided he had to go and see a psychiatrist. And he went to the psychiatrist Viktor Frankl. So this is Viktor Frankl telling the story, and he said to you know the, he he told Viktor Frankl what had happened that he'd been married to this wonderful woman for more than sixty years, and they'd lived together a very happy life, and everything they did they did together, and uh, and and now she passed away. And uh, he doesn't have anything to live for anymore. He just wants to die. So uh, Viktor Frankl said to him, tell me something. What would have happened if you would have died first and she would have survived you? So the man said, oh, that would have been terrible. The pain and the suffering that she would have gone through would have been absolutely unbearable. I would have hated to, to have it to go through, through that pain, through that suffering, through that terrible trauma of me passing away first. Because I know that she would have gone through tremendous, tremendous pain and suffering. So Viktor Frankl said to him, well then, you, you, you saved your wife from that pain and suffering by staying alive after she passed away, didn't you? And suddenly he saw the thing in a whole new light that his suffering, his surviving, had done her a favor, and he was happy. It was still difficult for him, no question about it, but he wasn't, he wasn't, he was in a different mindset already, different frame of mind altogether. Why did Sarah die? She was, she was old, 127 years old, and she'd lived her life. She did everything she had to do, and that was, um, was time for her to go. The immediate cause of her passing, the sages tell us, is that she heard the news of the Akeda, uh, the Akeda, the binding of Isaac. She was told that Abraham had actually slaughtered their son, and her soul flew out of her and didn't come back. Now, there's two interpretations of that. The soul flew out of her because she was in a state of ecstasy that her son had been raised up to the level of a holy sacrifice. That's one explanation. The other explanation is a simple explanation. She could not bear to have, 
she couldn't bear the news that her son was killed because that was their, that was the future. And her soul left her. In any event, the message is as follows. When it comes to a time of tragedy, when it comes to a time of loss, a time of tremendous uh, grief, how do we handle that? We learn from Abraham, we learn, we, we, we handle the pain, we handle the loss, we handle the grief by building, by looking to the future. If we live in the past, then life stops. You probably know the famous uh, story, uh, Charles Dickens, the famous story of the woman who was, um, whose husband didn't show up to the wedding. I forget what it's called now. The husband didn't show up to the wedding. Uh, in America, they read Charles Dickens at all. <laughs> um, yeah, it was hidden from her. It was hidden from her at that point in time. There's different explanations. Some say that uh, she knew that Isaac was not killed, but that he was now on a quantum leap higher, and she went to greet him there and didn't come back. It says that at the time of the Arcada, Isaac actually stayed in the garden. His soul arose to the highest level of the Garden of Eden, and he stayed there for two years, two years passed on earth, and she went to join him and didn't come back. He came back. In any event, um, the idea is that when we go through a period of grief, a period of loss, a period of mourning and tragedy and so on and so forth, the response is not to live in the past. The response is to look, toward, look towards the future. So that's what Abraham does. As soon as um, Sarah passes from this world, he gets moving and he starts to build the next generation. He makes a shidduch, he makes a, a match for Isaac, Yitzchak, and uh, finds her a wife. And uh, the next generation is on its way to being produced. Similarly with us, when we go through tragedy of any sort, um, the thing to do is not to look back. Yes, it is valid to reminisce about the great relationships, about the great past, about the closeness of the person that we were with. But looking back and living in the past, instead of living in the present and the future, makes us like Lot's wife. Uh, not Lot's wife. Uh, yeah, Lot's wife makes us like Lot's wife, we turn into a pillar of salt. She looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt, right? In other words, she turned into something that, that is not, it doesn't change. Salt is one of those things that, uh, you know, you don't need to keep salt in the fridge in case anybody didn't know. You don't keep salt in the fridge, and why? Because it, it, it never goes off. It's a preservative. Similarly, with looking into the past, one can turn into a pillar of salt. It, 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 it's, uh, it just preserves the past and doesn't, doesn't have any possibility of growth. You can't grow anything in salt. You can't grow anything even in the Dead Sea. There's nothing that grows there because it's too salty. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. Nothing grows. There's no plant life, no fish. And uh, this is true of um, the of Lot's wife, she was, she was stuck in the past, she turned into a pillar of salt. It shouldn't be true of us that we too, excuse me, we too turn into sort of zombies of the past. We're just looking, looking backwards. There's nothing wrong with looking backwards every now and then. For instance, on the anniversary of a person's death or um, something like that, we can reminisce and we can think about them and think about the positive things and what it is that they achieved in the world and what they taught us and what they gave us and so on. But the main thing is to build the next generation. Whenever there's death, immediately one turns towards life and regeneration. And that's the way it is, if the truth be told, when any kind of tragedy, not even if it's death, any kind of tragedy, any kind of... Um, 
uh, letdown or, or negative event that occurs, perhaps traumatic event, maybe not even traumatic, just a negative event that occurs, um, the mindset has to be what was, was. Now we're looking to the future. What's going to be the, the past was and will never be again. The future is yet to come, and that's where we had to. That's where we have to put our vision on. We have to fix our vision, focus our vision on the future. And that, in fact, is what makes the life of Sarah not the past life of Sarah, but the future life of Sarah. In other words, the past life of Sarah is. It's a monument, it's a monument to her life. But the past life of Sarah without the future life of Sarah isn't anything. That's why the first verse in the in this reading says like this, the days of the life of Sarah, 127 years, were the days of the life of Sarah. Why does it repeat it? There's the days of the life of Sarah and then again, at the beginning of the verse and again at the end of the verse, the days of the life of Sarah because there's two days. There's Yomim, what the Zohar calls Yomim Tatoin, the lower days. In other words, the days lived in the physical world. And there's the Yomim Iloyim, the upper days, the higher days, the days of the future. The days of spiritual revelation of the revelation of Sarah's soul, of the days of growth, the days of spiritual um, quantum leaps. And so the Zohar, so the verse uses both expressions. It uses the, the, the expression, the years of the life of Sarah and the years of the life of Sarah. Because there's really two lives. There's the life as it was lived in this world, and there's the life as it has its impact on the future. There's the life as it was, and there's the life as Abraham now starts to see and ensure continue into the future. And that's really what we have to do when it comes to... Um, um, When, when it comes to dealing with uh, any negative event or tragedy. Let me just uh, take some questions over here. Um, and I will say, you're gonna, yep, oh, that's it. Okay, any other questions? No other questions. All right, any questions so far?